about fungi. Third, talk about fungi in a plant organization. But it's so important because the plants and the fungi are really one big community. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, as well as the community of all of us doing community science, as we call it. The old world word was citizen science. That's been left to the side um, for community science. Okay, one last check. Is that showing out okay for everybody? Yeah, that's good. Great, thanks. Um, I started way back in the 60s foraging, eating, eating fungi, learning about fungi, and then have certainly moved on to research now. Um, I'll still eat and I'll still just look because they're beautiful and I'll touch and I'll taste. But now I'm really focused on what we're calling research. Um, most of this has been done through a nonprofit organization, Fungal Diversity Survey, that focuses on North American conservation of fungi and of habitats based on what we know about the fungi. Um, it supports a number of really cool projects, two really rare challenges, and we'll look at those a little later. A couple hundred projects like the two I'm going to describe with you tonight, a giant online database. Um, so far, of only 77,000 observations, but it's growing very, very quickly. And I've been on the board of that organization, still am, and in the management since 2019. Uh, we are now turning it over to a new team who are going to carry us to, to greater and higher places. Uh, my two projects are really important to me. One is on the Santa Cruz Island Reserve, the Nature Conservancy has a lot of the island, and we'll look at that later. And there's an island rediscovery project, basically a great lot of science that's all coming together to understand what's the situation and the potentials for that island. Doug and I there are focusing on the oaks and the bishop pines as two very fascinating habitats, although we're touching a little of everything. And then there's Orange County. I have a project here where we are very opportunistic. Anything we find anywhere, whether it's Casper's Park or my own front lawn, um, is just fair game for our project here. Well, we all individually know the kingdom of animals and uh, bizarre, beautiful, small, large, they're all wonderful, they surround us. And we know the kingdom of plants, from tiny, tiny two inch high Arctic willows to 400 foot high redwood trees and then all the other plants that are associated with them. Beautiful worlds. But of course, tonight, you know, we're gonna be working with a third kingdom and that is the kingdom of fungi. These images are from right here in Orange County, unlike the bison and some of what you just saw. Um, just to show the range and craziness and beauty of the fungi here locally. Um, all of these pictures, either Doug or I took, except the third one on the top row is from a tree um, that is now gone. It's part of the rest, it was part of the restoration project in Big Canyon in Upper Newport Bay. Peter Bryant took this picture, finding this beautiful collection of Oyster mushrooms, well, they might or might not be what we really call oyster once you do the genetics on them, but found that beautiful collection of oyster mushrooms. The rest of these mostly are from my own front yard, except for one. Fungi and plants have a lot of really excellent um, communication and sharing and, and uh, communalism in their habitats. Fungi decompose plants and animals, and it's about 90% of fungi. They parasitize plants and animals, and that's just a few fungi. And they associate with trees and shrubs and a wide range of uh, plants, including non-photosynthetic plants and funny orchids and all, and that's, only 5% of fungi, but it's with 95% of plants, including the beautiful natives 
we at CNPS really care about. We conceptualize this in the modern culture by a web, wood wide web often called, but a web of interconnected trees in a forest. And although this is artistic, it says again, 95% of all plants rely on fungi and here's how it works. You think that that's just art. Well, most of us call it art, but it is really reality. It is fact. Um, a, a grad student up in British Columbia finished a study in the early 2000s of a plot of 30 meter by 30 meter of Doug firs up in British Columbia. The size of each tree is uh, appropriately shown in the diagram from really tiny ones to giant ones. And he spent about three years digging under the trees in the soil and found that the trees are connected physically by mycelium, by the network of the fungi. The benefits of that were, well, the fact was that the largest trees were connected more to each other and to all the other trees. And uh, that was surprising and a, and a new find back then. The benefits of this network is that it transfers carbon, nutrients, and water to the trees. We all think, oh, trees and plants are so good at, at getting water from the soil. No, they're not. The fungi in association with the roots makes the transfer of water to the trees work very effectively. Um, the network of the fungi increases early survival and growth of the forest. It increases diversity of the forest. And it helps the trees defend against insects, pathogens, heat, rodents, and all sorts of other problems. And it, all of that is proportional to the amount of connection between one tree and another and how many trees they're connected with. Pretty fascinating. In other words, that other bit of art is really reality. The connection is by the mycelium, as you see on the left of the screen here. Mycelium is a little network of tiny, 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 you can see it with a loop, but you'll mostly just see white cottony stuff when you dig in your garden, tiny filaments. And that mycelium can live for years or millennia in your soil. Um, and every once in a while, a fungus shows up connected to that mycelium. The fungus might also exist just for an hour or a week or two, just like the tangerine tree in my backyard. Tanger the tree has lasted for about 40 years now, but the tangerines show up for uh, a few days, a few weeks, and that's it, and they're gone, unless the squirrels get them, of course. Picking the mushroom, is not any different than picking a tangerine off the tree. Doesn't hurt the organism at all. That mycelium is the organism of the fungus. The mushroom is just the tangerine hanging off the tree. Just like I won't break a branch off the tree to get a little tangerine, I also won't dig up the soil and hurt the mycelium like hurting the tree. But they are, they are equal organisms in their different kingdoms. Let's dial down a little bit and look under the ground and see what this mycelium is really about. A um, Couple people did loblolly pine study and those at the top uh, are seven, I guess, little tiny loblolly pines. And you can see the brown roots extending from those into the soil. But you can also see the mycelium, the fungus. There's probably two different fungi interacting with those loblolly pines. And the mycelial mat there is giant compared to the root system. Um, the mycelium from one mature tree, whether it's an oak or a pine or many others, can circle the earth several times if you took those filaments and spread them all out. There's a fungus up in Oregon that weighs over 600 tons covers almost 2,500 acres. And how they know it's one fungus is just simply by doing some DNA analysis and going farther and farther and farther out till they find a different fungus. Not a different species, but a different specific fungus. Um, uh, pretty amazing how large it can be. 
connecting all the trees in that 2,500 acres. In fact, as you can see from this image, probably in the realm of 90% of underground living matter in forests, in densely covered forests, other than roots, is fungi. And that's by volume or by weight. And of course, every once in a while, a mushroom appears. And then we say, oh, guess what? There must be mycelium in the soil here. So how does this actually work? There's two big groups of fungi that interact with plants. And one group is called ectomycorrhizal, ECM, and the other is called endomycorrhizal or vascular. And we're gonna look at how they both work, basically. And ectomycorrhizal is an external covering of the roots of the tree, as you see in the brown rectangle here. The blue mycelium wanders around the root, goes through inside, not the cells, not the cortical cells, but those little hyphae, the little bits of the mycelium go throughout the root and are able then to transfer nutrients that they find from decomposed organic matter into the tree or the other plant. Fungi get something out of the deal too. Since the plants are primarily photosynthetic, they, the plants make all sorts of carbohydrates, sugars, and that's what the fungi get, and they thrive on that. The interesting thing about the ectomycorrhizal, ECM fungi, is that they're very specific pairing with plants and fungi. And this will play very strongly when we talk about conservation and rehabilitation of forests later. Very specific. Um, and eventually all of those, virtually all of those can produce what we call mushrooms. The other kind of fungi are endomycorrhizal. Um, oh, by the way, I should say with the ECMs, only about 2% of plant species by definition use those and associate with those fungi. But guess what? They're giant groups. Um, all, the, all the oaks, pines, willows, rose families, and more. So it's a great part of plants, even though it's 2% of species. So we go down to the arbuscular. And what happens there is that the mycelium, the little bits, the hyphae, actually go inside the cortical cells of the plants and make, whether you see in the micrograph here, the electron micrograph, or in the diagram, they make arbuscles, big collections of fungal material inside the cells. Another way of allowing nutrients to transfer back and forth. Very similar to ectomycorrhizal, except here, it's number one, virtually with every plant out there. And number two, it, cap it helps the plants capture nutrients from the soil, not from decomposed matter, generally. The effect for us though, is that there's no fungi, no mushrooms popping up out of the ground from these arbuscular endomycorrhizal fungi. So you don't get to see those. You've got to do uh, environmental DNA studies or by hand going under the trees and, and looking around and then looking through microscopes to be able to see those. So where does all this happen? Every habitat that has plants, and as Dan, I think, asked earlier, how about after fires? Absolutely, there are fire-following fungi. How about in the most arid of deserts? As long as there are some plants, there are fungi. And in every other forest imaginable. And especially on your home lawn. These are all ones from my home lawn. Some of the 30 or so species that we've found growing on our little property here in Tustin. Um, except for that one center bottom where I'm smiling. Um, you notice those fungi, giant batch of fungi have gone off on tree roots from the tree on the left. And they followed those roots. And when a man called me over, hey, Joanne, take a look at these. I said, oh boy, on one side, because they're eminently edible and both Doug and I love them. But on the other side, oh boy, I'm sorry to tell you, your tree is dying and you're gonna be taking it out very soon. And sure enough, the next year, it was gone. 
in the meantime, these honey mushrooms followed the roots and uh, were decomposing what was already considerably dead. Well, since I'm looking for the fungi there, this brings us to what is community science for fungi? And we're gonna talk about how you each can join me in getting involved. Um, there's an odd situation that exists. And that is that less than 10% of fungal species are known. Um, probably there's as many as 10,000 species not known in California that exist, but we haven't learned about them yet. We don't even have names for, for most of them. There might be as many as 1,500 living in Orange County and probably 80 or 90% of those we don't know the names of yet. Their distribution is not known. Their seasonality is not well known. So Ron or, or maybe Dan asked earlier, how do you know when they're gonna come up? Or Ron asked, how do you know when they're gonna come up? How long after a rain? Well, until we get a lot more data, we really don't know. Um, we're also learning the essentials of how plants and fungi interact and how we can use that information for conservation, uh, restoration projects, and, uh, and many other elements of conservation and management plans for land, protected land. So how could that situation be? We know plants, we know probably 95, 98% of plants in most habitats. We know almost 100% of species of animals on all of planet earth, not quite, but almost. Um, but fungi live underground, so they go unseen. They show themselves very unpredictably. I might see one even in my yard three or four years continuously, and then I'm not seen it again for 20 years, and then it'll pop up. Luckily, we've been here, I don't know, 35 years. So I have a chance to see those long-term fruitings if I'm around. But it makes it very hard to study them because if it doesn't show itself for 30 years and you only do a five-year study, you're gonna miss it. Um, and sadly, there's not enough academic mycologists and taxonomists around now. Mycologists being those people who specifically, like a botanist, studies plants. These folks study the kingdom of fungi and taxonomists now. Um, just like our local university has a department of ecology and you know, biologic ecology, or I'm missing the word it's called. Um, we don't have a taxonomy department and we don't have people teaching taxonomy classes anymore. So who is left to go out and collect the basic data? You see me on the ground there, happy as could be, out on the uh, island, out on Santa Cruz Island at the end of January, less than a month ago. We are the ones who can find out what the spe species are, where they are, and when they show. Um, community science to the rescue. So what do our studies really involve? Um, we have a number of steps we follow. We first, of course, go out and think and plan where we're going to look, but then we collect what we see. We document by taking photographs, by writing notes in the field, by taking it back to the taking those notes back to the computer and putting them in online databases, then we dry the fungi and you know dehydrate them so they'll last forever. We take little bits and nibbly pieces for some DNA barcoding, some molecular analysis, and then we package them up so we can take them over to um, a fungarium. Ah, what's a fungarium? How about an herbarium for fungi or that cabinet over on the right-hand side that they'll let us use for fungi? <laughs> so there's many steps to the process. After we collect, for example, for eight or nine or 10 hours out on Santa Cruz Island, what else is there to do in the evening except this process? It's well worth it. We document them online in a very, very public way. Um, at least we believe in making the data public for current and future study. Many people, as the CMPS often does, document on iNaturalist. 
and some of my fungi are there, not too many, with some good notes and people make comments and that's excellent. Um, there's another site that I put virtually all of mine on and that's Mushroom Observer. Just like Bug Guide works for insects, Mushroom Observer is specific to fungi, including lichens, which are kingdom fungi as well. And, but both, both sites can curate an awful lot of information and a lot of images. Then there's casual, um, beautiful, robust sites like the Natural History of Orange County site run through UC Irvine that Peter Bryant has started and still manages where there's a page for plankton and there's a page for whales and there's pages and pages for fungi. And that's another place where you can learn and see. After all the data is collected and the molecular data is gathered, we send the data to a number of portals of databases up in the sky. One of them is GenBank, which is most important for fungi in this country. Unite is good for environmental DNA that includes fungi. Each one has specific use and, uh, and act, we have access to. But GenBank is where we really want all the data to go and the molecular data to go to make it public so it can be accessed for studies now and in the future. Well, I'd like to jump into our two projects. Um, one is one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth, I think, and I hope you agree with that. It's the Santa Cruz Island Reserve owned and primarily run by the Nature Conservancy. It's about three quarters, about 50,000 acres almost, of Santa Cruz Island off our coast, which you can see from the top of Saddleback on a clear day. The other uh, part of the island is almost 15,000 acres run by the National Park Service. And if you want to go out and see Santa Cruz Island, I heartily encourage you to. You'll go to the Park Service side. There'll be four or five days of wonderful hiking if you really want to move around. There'll be uh, campgrounds available and it's a wonderful place. But the Nature Conservancy side of the island is really for research and conservation. Um, it's a very special place. Historically, for a couple thousand years, a number of thousands of years, it was inhabited by what has become the Chumash. Um, in some of the late 1700s to early 1900s, or certainly the late 1800s, was inhabited by also some Spanish and then in the mid-1800s onward by ranchers, which are no longer there, but they really brought a lot of wildlife out to the islands of Santa Cruz and some of the other channel islands as well. And, uh, but they're gone now. There's a tremendous wealth of other resources out on the island, archeological and paleontological sites, so many. And you would expect that if the islands had been occupied since probably about 10,000 uh, or about for 10,000 years. There are dozens of major sea caves and Doug and I have had the opportunity to paddle in almost all of the major sea caves on the island. There's endemic plants, birds, and other animals. And whenever you're out there, the little three to four pound island endemic foxes are whizzing around and coming up and looking at you in the eye. The uh, very large, um, what do we call them? The bluebirds. Oops, Island the scrub jay. Oh, thank you. The island scrub day. They come and they harass us wherever we are. And they're giant scrub jays. They're just beautiful. Um, many endemic plants, birds, and other animals. And it's always exciting to see those. The mountains in the center of the island range to almost 2,500 feet. And of course, as you might guess, with all the habitats that that involves, we find an awful lot of species of fungi. They are waiting there for us. As Ron said years ago, Ron Vanderhoff, who's on the call today, strange plants in strange places. I hope that's right, Ron. It goes for fungi too. Take a little bitty island out in the middle of the ocean that's never been connected to the mainland and we will find, take a look at the red dots down there, we will find an awful lot of fungi. Um, wonderful place. 
Our work on the island um, has involved uh, four trips of four or five days each over the last four years. Um, Doug and I have gone out and made about 185 full real documented collections and many, many other observations. We've spent time collecting in the Central Valley on the ridges where the pine trees live very high in the lush oak woodlands and the grove down the center there of over 100 year old eucalyptus stands. And then in mixed coastal oak and scrub as you see in the upper right picture. Um, but wherever you are on the island, whether you're under a tree because that's where you found another patch of fungi or out in the middle of this hillside down on the lower right where it's all manzanita and a few beautiful pine trees. There's always fungi absolutely everywhere that there's plants out there. Um, the Nature Conservancy has been very kind to support this research, um, both by access and logistics to make it possible to move around the 47,000 acres um, out on the island and is very, very interested in the data that we bring back. In fact, what is it that we're finding out there? Oh, an awful lot of very interesting things. Of course, many new records for the island. That's pretty easy. And new records for all the Channel Islands. That was eight different islands that we do find out there um, on this island. There's many undescribed and new species that we're learning about simply because we can do some DNA analysis on them. Um, we're seeing new distributions new hosts, new life forms, and of course, invasives. Let me walk you through a couple of these. Um, over on the left is a very odd puffball that has purple um, spores on the inside that breaks up readily. It is the second time it's been seen in North America. And the only other time was in Texas. Um, and yet it was up on a ridge line, very exposed with dead pine trees, second time in North America. The next one is an example of an invasive that we found, um, Amanita panthronoides. We found the first one south of like about Morro Bay or Sonoma County, somewhere up there on uh, Santa Cruz Island. And the second one that's been found south of way up there on our Orange County study. So now we know it's two places down here in Southern California. Well, my guess is it's in many more places. We just need people to go out and look. Um, here's a very interesting one. This is a Pleurotus uh, on a giant Coreopsis. Well, Pleurotus genus grows on oak and very, uh, mature hardwood trees, especially when they're dying. It's only once ever before been seen on something other than hardwood trees. That was probably this one on Santa Rosa Island next door, but it wasn't collected or documented except by a snap picture. So we don't really know much, but this one is out for DNA barcoding right now. And we'll see if it's a standard uh, what we think of, what we know as a species of Pleurotus, but it sure is odd to have it on a giant flowering plant. Um, down here is one, just a really pretty mushroom. Um, it's the first a polypore. It's the first one that's been found in the Channel Islands. It is known from the mainland. And this one in the lower right is the first in this genus on the whole west coast. Well, it's a fairly new genus, but it really deserves to be a genus. It's very far from other boletes, which is the category that has a uh, fungi that has these little pores as reproductive structures. But this is the first one on the West Coast. We found it on the island. And then my favorite of all is what I'm calling here an eight-headed Amanita. And Amanita is a mushroom genus like this one, number two here, where a cap and a base are start out as a, an egg, as a whole connected cup. And then the stem stipe expands and the cap falls away from the base. 
and forms something sort of like this one in the upper right. You can see the base here, barely attached to the cap. But this particular one we found is the first on record with more than one mushroom body inside the cup. And there were eight of them at least. Uh, we've had a lot of communication with the world's expert on Amanita and Rod Tulis has assured us that there is no record going back to the 1600s of more than one in a, in a cup like this, in a vulva, as it's called. It's like finding an eight-headed lizard or an eight-headed insect. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's something new, but it sure means it's something odd. And uh, it was delightful to find that on Santa Cruz Island. The bottom line out there is that it's really easy for us to make new, find new uh, invasives, new range distributions, extensions, new forms of life and new hosts in a place where there's so little known about fungi. One find we've had on Santa Cruz Island is especially interesting, we think. It's really quite great news. The, the forest of Bishop Pine uh, has been decimated by first years of drought and then secondly by years of bark beetle infestation. And it's just a tragedy. We were out there in the early 80s and saw the forest at its prime or mid 80s. And it's, it's not that way now, you see in the upper right picture. But in our explorations, and we spent a lot of time there, including just four weeks ago, in our explorations of that forest, we find a wide range of mycorrhizal fungi that work specifically with pines, including this one on the left that was described from Santa Cruz Island from the bishop pines up on this ridge. And these are abundant now, as are truffles, um, undescribed species of another bolete over here on the right, and then one that we won't know what is until we get it barcoded here in the middle, a trichoma of a certain kind. But the best news is if all of these mycorrhizal fungi are abundant in this forest, guess what? See all the recruit down at the bottom of the image at the top? All the new pines, these are associated with those. It's well known that dead pine trees do not have these mycorrhizal fungi associated with their roots. The only way these will be there is because there's an abundance of new pines. The pines live and that's, that's great for us to know. And we know some of why is because these fungi are connected. So let's look briefly at our, our Orange County project. This is our opportunistic fun project. You can tell where my house is because of the great abundance of fungi around the house. We've made here about 180 actual collections, plus many hundreds of other observations, including uh, Ron just put a bunch up two weeks ago on iNaturalist, which is very valuable. Some of these are undescribed and new to science. Some of them are major range extensions. And of course, for most of these, we are waiting our DNA results. So we can see what they actually are. The funny thing with the public databases is there's some wonderful people who really are brilliant at identifying species by looking at an image and they'll say, oh, Joanne, this one is this, and this one is this, and this one is this, ha ha, until we get them barcoded and we find out. Of course, you can say it's this because that's the only fungus you know that looks like that. But look, we've got a new species, something that's very, very different from the one that's in the book. Um, pretty exciting. So let's look at some of the finds we've made here. Let me walk you through this little batch, and then we'll start talking about how you can get involved. Here's an odd little fungus that we found in the sands of Upper Newport Bay. Portia Bryant found one collection and called us up right away. And then Doug and I found hundreds with where she found hers. And then uh, we found one other collection a week later. These are the first two collections of this species south of Mendocino or west of New Mexico. That's a big range extension. Um, down here is that Swillis quiescens that we found on the island and it was described from the top ridge of the Bishop Pines. 
well, guess what? We found it less than a hundred feet from our house at the school nearby under some pines. So I said, well, you know, I've lived here 30 years, but let's look at those pines and see what they really are. They are bishop pines that have been there about 50 years. And this is the first time I've seen the Swillis showing up with them that was described with the bishop pines. Um, it's quite likely I just never saw them before or they were hiding for the last 30 years. Who knows? This one is a beautiful fungus. We're trying to get a, a real good idea on it. Saw down in Aliso and Wood Canyon in the uh, regional park. This is one that I love. It's only found in really arid areas, especially where you don't even think there's other plants for it to associate with. But it's one of 14 species of agaricus. Garicus is the little store-bought mushroom that you tend to eat in the evening and saute up. We found 14 species in that genus, and this is one of them. This picture was taken by Peter Bryant. Um, this summer, up in Irvine Regional Park, I found twice, after lawn mowing in between, two fairy rings, giant fairy rings, each time of over 270 mushrooms in half of a 72 foot in diameter circle. They weren't showing up in the other half, who knows why. But imagine seeing that, it was fun to count them. Then the lawnmower came and I cried, went back two weeks later and there they were again in that exact same half of the circle. Well, there's one other here I want to share and of course it's my favorite. And that is over in that schoolyard back in 2019 when our fundus organization, that fungal diversity study, collaborated with a myco blitz, NYCO mushroom blitz, we found these in the school, less than 100 feet from my house. And they were beautiful and they came up by the hundreds. So I documented them and sent them off for barcoding and all. And you know what we found? They were a new range extension in North America. They in fact have been seen in Northern Europe, but primarily in Pakistan. And somebody asked, well, Joanne, how'd they get here? Did somebody come from Pakistan and walk on that land? Highly unlikely. The lawn is at least 50 years old. The, it hasn't been moved or done anything with except barely fertilized for 50 years, but they just popped up. I've been looking, they've not been before. Since 2019, I've found them on our home lawn, 100 feet away, and up in Irvine Regional Park, first in North America. Um, one of our friends has found a collection up in uh, Oregon, and they got them barcoded and found, sure enough, they're the same. So goodbye, Pakistan. Hello, Western North America. I think when more community scientists look for these things, we will find them more places. But it's pretty exciting to find a Pakistani mushroom here in Tustin. So I'd like to encourage you all to consider getting more involved with fungi. This Fungal Diversity Survey is just an enabling organization. Um, they host a couple rare challenges, one on the West Coast of those 20 species. And these are all species that are either rare or threatened or highly underdocumented. There's a diversity database we host on iNaturalist. Um, and you can add, just like we do with the plant bio blitzes through CNPS, you can add your observations of fungi without doing all the collecting or anything right there on the iNaturalist. We host a couple hundred projects like the two that I've described that Doug and I have um, on the Nature Conservancy's part of Santa Cruz Island and then here in Orange County. And we do barcoding, uh, DNA barcoding. That project, that program is currently on hold. We've done over 8,000 barcodes from our projects, but we need funding to give more grants to do more. And until that funding appears, um, we're at the end of any barcoding we can do, sad to say. Um, the mission of Fundus is to engage all of us, increase our knowledge and public awareness of the distribution of fungi, show us how to do it, how to find and document the fungi, and partner with land managers, conservationists, and scientists to make sense of it all in the habitats. 
three of the fungi on the rare challenge are ones we should find here in Southern California. There's one on Manzanita. It grows about four inches high. It needs wet weather, so we're past that right now. I don't think it's going to rain again until November or December, but we will look for those next year. There's another one in really dry places um, that's about 15 inches tall, a very stocked oddball. And it has been seen on San Nicolas Island off the coast. It's been seen up in Utah, and it's been seen in Arizona. No reason we shouldn't find it in our arid habitats here. And then there's one that grows on sagebrush that's very rarely documented. They can be as much as about five inches long and they grow primarily on the main stalks of mature um, Artemisia sagebrush bushes. And we've got to find some of those too. How you get involved, pretty simple. Um, first of all, get excited tonight and think about finding those all. Think about walking with me on a trail somewhere in some pretty place like Casper's Park with Ron and, and a group a couple weeks ago. Um, get a field guide, get the California Mushrooms book. Look for fungi and anywhere you are. They're in your yard, they're in your potted plants, and they're on every trail you walk. Learn to identify them, of course, first to group. And then eventually you get good and can look at the parts and all and, and identify them to species perhaps. It's a big learning curve, just like it is with insects or animals or plants, certainly. Um, with insects, you see something fluttering around and you say, oh, it's a pollinator, it must be a butterfly. And then one day you realize, oh, moths and butterflies are very similar. You have to look at the antennae and a couple other things. And then you can see the different moth and a butterfly. Well, the same thing happens with fungi. The closer you look, the more you see, the more you understand. There are only a few tools that you need to gather up. A basket trowel, a loop to look closely at, a knife and some paper bags. Everyone has a camera or a cell phone. These days, they all have close-up lenses, so you can get really good, clear pictures. You learn the field techniques. Um, document, photograph, and if you have permission on the land, collect, dry, and wrap, and save it for a fungarium, but that's only if you have permission. Um, take spore prints, which anybody can do, a kid can do, and it's a fun project for kids. Do chemical tests and microscopy if you want to get more involved. Post all your finds on either Mushroom Observer or iNaturalist, your choice. And uh, boy, please have fun doing it. Enjoy that art and science of fungi. They are everywhere you look, sometimes even above your head. I'd like to offer some thanks and some resources here. Um, I've got a great, or a long anyway, resource sheet that lists many resources from tonight's presentation, including uh, websites and our lists of uh, photograph lists of fungi on Mushroom Observer of these two projects. And uh, everything from cookbooks to my email address is on that list. Um, I'd like to thank tonight Ron for leading the walk every year that we get to do a foray with the fungi and adding so much botanical information as we go along on the walks. Peter Bryan, of course, for the hosting the Natural History of Orange County website, which I use an awful lot. Um, TNC, the Nature Conservancy, for hosting our Santa Cruz Island project as part of their um, island, uh, as part of their research on the islands. Peter Bowler and Rebecca Crow at the UCI Fungarium. Matt Gilliams at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden Fungarium for the island um, voucher specimens that we leave. And of course, Doug for uh, photography and as you see, untiring uh, field work um, and his photography, of course. Well, I'm keen, of course, to answer questions and I'll stop sharing my screen. I see there's lots that's happened in the chat and some will have questions. And while that's happening, I'm gonna take that screen share 
and show people where they can get some of those resources that you just talked about. So if people go to our homepage, we'll probably leave up your talk for tonight for a couple more time, uh, night, days. And at the bottom down here, you can see there's a jump and it goes straight to this wonderful set of resources that she's provided us. Just the quick hits of where to look and where to start uh, finding what you want on one page. If you forget about this, you quickly go on vacation, you come back and you wanna know where to go, we can hold on. She allowed us to hold on to this. After <laughs> our plant science and our quick website, right? We have a number of resources right here. We have, well, we have floors and plant lists, which if you're in plants, you need to come back here sometime and see what we're holding on to. But right here are other favorite resources and you'll find the same document in the list. And this will be here long-term. And she is, there it is. Okay, so now you know to go where they are for the basics. Let's look in the chat or people can try to raise their hand and we can go to actual questions real time right now with Joanne. Thank you, glad you put that up. Uh, also, there's several of those links in the chat, including a Mushroom Observer and the Orange County Natural History website are in the chat. So hope you enjoy those too. Let's see, there are a couple of questions. Let me start at the top and see what we found. How has the mega drought affected fungal communities? Well, it's affected the plants and what affects the plants affects the fungi. And we know there's a lot less out there and it wouldn't surprise me if we could look forward 10 or 15 years and see that this drought, just like the last one about five years ago, doesn't have long-term effects on both the plants and their associated fungi. Let's see, is there another mushroom that looks like that little parasol little tincta? I've seen one in turf in the past. Um, yeah, there are actually several. The genus Parasol has three or four locally, and that's what I assumed at first this was, but that's why we do the DNA barcoding is to find out it's not even close. Um, but yeah, there are several others you will see in the book that look like that, that are also genus Parasol. Let's see. Well, good fun. Um, any other questions? Unmute yourself and ask if you have or comments. It looks like Bob Allen had asked, what's the full name of the California Fungus Field Guide? It's California Mushrooms. Simple, not a very colorful title, but a great book. California Easy. Mushrooms. Easy to remember, yes. And then write books. There's other them. ones too. And there's North American wide books and whatever part of the country you're in, you will find field guides, just like for plants. But the best one here, 2017, I think is California mushrooms. Oh, and there Bob answers his own question farther down. Good. And Justina has her hand and up. So does What's Ron. up, Justina? Hello. Hello. Fantastic presentation as always, Joanne. I was curious, you mentioned that you go four times a year to the Channel Islands, Doug, that's wonderful. And I'm curious to know if you go particularly, I don't know, perhaps twice in the spring and twice in the fall when it's mushroom season, or do you also go in the summer and winter? What's it like? Well, actually, um, I might've misspoken. We've gone four times total for four or five days each time. Oh, got it, I'm sorry about four that. four years. So four, okay. four, four. Um, if, you know, it's, a, it's complicated logistics and there's significant space limitations because the people who study the foxes and the birds and the herps and the, spite, the trapdoor spiders and all those people are out there too. And especially with COVID the last couple of years, we've required to go out only when we have a certain territory to ourselves or the, right. the housing and the laboratory to ourselves. So right. uh, once a year, if there were no constraints on logistics or our time 
I would go out in November and December and January and February, and then probably again in August, if some rains came in the summer. Right, that's very I nice. Would. And do you, do you camp there or do you go backpacking? Well, we stay in research facilities. That's very nice. Yeah. Thank that's you so nice. much. Uh, Nature Conservancy is very, very kind to its researchers. We have a question from uh, Kelly Ueda on the chat. Can you give us some tips for taking better photos for iNaturalist? What are the features we should be paying attention to? Well, that's a perfect question. Um, on the Fundus website, the Fungal Diversity Survey, there's a couple sections that go into great depth about what pictures to take. Basically, you need to unearth one of the mushrooms. You need to take a picture of every part, you know, from head to toe, under the armpits and everywhere. You need to look at all sides and faces of the mushroom and get as close as you can to all of them. You need to take an image or two with a scale, a ruler. So we have a sense of, um, is it a, are we talking about a two inch thing or a 15 inch thing? And we do have on our website, on that uh, Fungal Diversity Survey website, one now and two within a week of we call field data slips, little pieces of paper with all the little fields you can take notes in to remind you of all the notes you wanna take. One is an extensive list and one is a sort of a learner beginner list. And that'll encourage you to take notes about the habitat. You know, is it under an oak tree or a pine tree? Is it a mature oak tree or just a sapling, et cetera? Are there any other insects nearby or fungi nearby, et cetera? So the, I would go onto the website and see there's both a short video and several places where there's images of what kind of pictures you really want to take. But that also goes with notes to take about the habitat and measurements if you're careful. Otherwise, just put a ruler down and that's pretty close. Good question. Others? Daphne uh, Christie is asking, how do citizen scientists or community scientists uh, and hobbyists help provide samples for DNA barcoding? Can you explain the end part oh. and then how it gets recorded scientifically? Sure. There's two parts to that. One is how you do the collection. And that is, you get some clean utensils, a clean knife that you fire off with a, um, a flame and a snippers, a scissors you fire off with a flame and little um, very, very clean scientific tubes or little glassine bags that you can snip off particular parts of a mushroom, little bits, size of a grain of rice and put in the tube or the bag. Those instructions are also on the website, on the Fundus website. How you get them analyzed, well, how you get them barcoded is another thing. You can go to a private service for about $30 each. You can, um, if you have connection to a local university, you might get a lab at the university to do the proper barcoding. All the specs are on our website and the lab will know whether it does ITS one and two or not, they'll know that right away. And uh, so you get it barcoded that way. The trick is getting someone to analyze the molecular data as we call it, the little CGTs and A's, getting someone to analyze that with you for you or you learn how to do it yourself. And then it gets in a database put up to uh, GenBank is the best for what we do, but big databases in the sky. All of that for level one is, is listed and described on the Fundus website. Um, until recently, we were giving grants to projects like ours for doing this, so I don't have to pay $30 each to do it. Um, you can get grants several different ways. We are no longer able to do that because we've run out of those grant funds, but there's a, if you want to get more involved, you can email me after you've taken a look at the website and learn just what's involved. It is not hard and it's easy to send stuff off. It's tricky to get it uh, barcoded or to get it analyzed after you get the barcode. Okay, looks like a question from Siri Adams. Okay, hi. 
Thank you so much for presenting and speaking with us tonight. Um, I had a few questions actually. So sure. with identifying, um, it's all a matter of timing. And I noticed that like the rain, of course, has everything to do with that and the amount. Um, but my question is, is, yeah, how can you time that perfectly? I noticed that like with the short, quick rains that we've been having, I almost feel like um, you want to go out in like the first three days. You know, I normally wait like a week, a week and a half to let things settle in and fruit and do all of their magic, you know. But I also feel that with such a lack of moisture, it's almost like they've um, they've almost like become more rapid with fruiting because of the lack of water and just wanting to create spores, you know, and reproduce. So I'm wondering if that has anything to do with, I don't know, it's just again, timing, like how can you, sometimes it takes a week for them to pop up. How can you like better time after? You the know, rain? you really can't better time. You <laughs> go out as often as you can and when you can. Yeah. And even in the summer, I'll find some fungi, hmm. but, um, but you go out as often as you can and when you can. Yeah, it's and it's climate dry. change has made everything really dry. Yeah. The plants are suffering. My tree limbs are falling off. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is suffering. It's just, it's a bad time we live in. Mm -hmm. um, will there be another wet winter during our lifetimes? I surely hope so. I hope there'll be 10 of them in a row, in which case you'll be able to go out every day from the 1st of November through the end of April. Yeah, yes, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think we are, um, we've been going for quite a while. I saw one question here. Oh, I like, I recommend mushrooms demystified and all that the rain promises. Um, mushrooms demystified is written by a friend of ours, a wonderful guy. And the second edition of the first edition of the book was California. The second edition of the book went more for the Western United States. It's just very highly out of date. It's excellent. I carry a copy in the van with us and I carry, have a copy by my computer, but it's very, very out of date taxonomically, um, but it's very helpful. So start there and then look at a more current book like California Mushrooms. Okay. With that, most, then, most of David's pictures in that book are black and white, most of them. So it's a, and very few measurements and all. So, the modern book is, I think, more comprehensive, but if you have a copy of that, it is wonderful. And it's, uh, I lived with it, three different editions, three different copies of it, till they just got uh, threadbare. <laughs> Very good. So everyone, uh, either if you have uh, audio going, then it's clapping or your emoticons or a chat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Yo. Lots of fun. Thank and you thank all you for, for being here. Thank you for leaving us the sheet that we're going to keep on our resources page for quite a while long, much longer. And quick tip to everyone else out there, uh, look to next month, the Garden Allies, which will be at Tree of Life Nursery, and the Botany Blitz, which is just uh, about a month out there also in March. Hope to all see you um, on the trail or in the garden again. I think we're done for tonight. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, thanks. Great job. Thank you, Joanne. Beautiful. Thank you so much.